Hello. Perfect. So we're going to have uh, Wuka Schlanga that's going to present Unicode. Um, what's the big deal? Um, and we're going to have a bit of time afterwards for questions. So keep your questions. Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to talk about Unicode today. Everything that I'm talking about is going to work on Python 3 by default. should also work on Python 2, unless it doesn't, and then it's going to be in bright red so that you can see how life was worse with Python 2. My name is Wukash Langa. I'm from the internet. You can find me in all those places there. Um, but my life could honestly be presented as an endless character encoding horror story, starting from like, you know, funny things that happen to me all the time to uh, annoying things that happen to me all the time where people can't buy my stuff because they cannot find it, including like funny stuff like this very presentation where I had to hack my own name because the font just doesn't have that letter there. Um, but I wanted to give you an example where it's a little less funny. A few years back, I was uh, flying out of this beautiful country, um, and I just wanted to board a plane. But our internal uh, you know, uh, booking system uh, created an encoding error, and the gentleman at the airport said, like, dude, um, you really need to get a ticket for your own name. This is somebody else, and I cannot you know, pass you through security. I was uh, very nervous at the time because uh, I was a little late to the airport and didn't really have time to resolve this issue. So he's like, no, really, you just have to go to the uh, you know, ticketing office and get another ticket. So I did, and it had the exact same encoding error in it. Uh, so that didn't work. So I was you know, very nervous, like, how do I solve this issue? And I did. Uh, you know how? I went to a different security officer. <laughs> And this one just didn't care. He was like, fine, just go, I believe you. So we're talking about text handling, right? But first of all, we need to answer the question what text actually is. So given this you know, abstract text, we didn't really you know, need to know what it says. We see that text consists of words. Words consist of letters. Like All of this um, is pretty natural when you, know, you don't have to like, really think about structuring uh, all the possible you know, components of text. So in Python, we have all the possibilities to express all those possible um, components of text with letters, numbers, punctuation, and white space. And all of these we can then transform. We can capitalize them, we can count the numbers of them, we can sort them, we can do multiple nice things with them, but the most important thing that we're doing with information is transmission, right? We're sending an a piece of information to somebody else to read, to understand what we mean. So if we want to do this thing, how would we actually deliver it to recipients? So I don't want to talk to you um, about like smoke signals and homing pigeons. I'm not even going to talk to you about like the original Morse telegraph uh, and its analog Morse code, but I'm going to go like all the way uh, to the current times and talk to you about this uh, technological marvel. That's Emile Baudot's telegraph transmitter used in his printing telegraph. It didn't use the Morse code, but instead encodes characters to a series of bits, which are sent over wire or radio. And if you see those five you know, keys on there, it's really because it was just a five-bit encoding. So the speed of transmission, a symbol rate, measured still today, is called BOD because of Emile Baudot. So it goes all the way then uh, to the you know, 1800s. This is the encoding table for how you would actually, uh, you know, translate characters into those bits of information that you can send over the radio. That code was patented like 1874. It became known as the International Telegraph Alphabet. It was followed by ITA2 in 1924, and that thing is still used to this very day. But the thing that you are using is this. That's US ASCII, right, for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. And as you can see, the first two um, sticks here 
just describe things that were just control characters on a teletype for which ASCII was originally designed, which is not much different from uh, the machine I showed you before. So this is a way to encode letters and other characters into bits of information that you, you transmit. So we're talking encodings, right? A way of, to, of transmitting this, uh, translating this into this. So the ASCII encoding has a bit of a problem. Let's say the author of that machine would want to encode his own name in it, right? Like, who would like that? Well, he would like that, but you cannot, right? ASCII with 7-bit just doesn't have the first letter of his first name there in the encoding. And that was a problem for multiple use cases. So naturally, we had different code pages or encodings that arrived later on. And finally, you were able to say, you know, encode Emil Bodot's first name. But what about me? Well, in this case, you couldn't. Again, like, we cannot really write a sentence that includes both of those names. Um, so you would have to uh, envision another code page. And this is exactly what happened. We had another one that includes my, uh, you know, first letter of my first name. So I'm happy now, right? But at the same time, at this very spot in the coding page, there was a different character before, and now you cannot express this one. So you can, for instance, not write an empty set symbol anymore. So this was a problem, right? And after Windows came in, like, it mangled characters like yet in another way so that you can express a different set of characters, but not all of them at the same time. And better yet, if you, you know, notice, the first character of my name actually moved between spaces. Now it's a different code expressing the same thing. So there was a lot of confusion there, and obviously ISO and Linux that is using it like, had its own thing still. So this is how this landscape looked like for most of the 90s and the very early 21st century for people in Central Europe. You know, the same piece of content was very often mangled if you didn't know the encoding w which was used to actually write that data there. So the first lesson coming from this is that programs that assume you can just open a plain text file and it's going to be OK are broken. So speaking about all this, we're like, characters are not bytes. Because obviously, the same byte might represent a different character. So what is a character? This problem with having many encodings and many code pages that are incompatible and partial obviously um, needed a re resolution. So in 1991, we had the Unicode Consortium f uh, formed which, you know, wanted to create a universal character set. And they have this massively thick book of all the possible characters that you can now represent. And they are an abstract concept, right? Just a character that just has a number in their all long list of possible characters. It has sometimes a name, um, but this is it. This is a character. So let's say you would like to express one of the strange Polish, um, you know, um, diacritical characters, which is this Latin small letter E with ogonek. The fun thing about this is that in Python, you can actually use the long name and it'll work, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> so coming back to this, code points that I just presented to you are just abstract theoretical concepts. You don't really know how they are represented inside the interpreter because you don't have access to this. What you're doing is you are getting a code point that specifies which character you mean, but you don't care about its representation. So given the code points here, see, like the U plus means we care about the code points, so we can capitalize, we can sort, we can do stuff like this. We can represent this in Python using, you know, a backslash U escapes. And then we're going to get everything correctly. However, if you want to do operations on those uh, characters later, by default in Python 3, everything happens as you would expect. By default on Python 2, you're going to quickly see that the representation of text is partial and incorrect. In fact, the upper casing, sorting, and other operations like this are only implemented for the ASCII subset, and everything else is simply just passed through as 
Python doesn't really understand them. You can work around the issue in Python 2 by specifying the U prefix and you know, by making sure that you're handling Unicode every time. But if you forget, or if your source code file doesn't use this for a literal, well, this is what you're getting. Let's go back to data transmission then. We have the text that we wanted to transmit. It's all just a series of Unicode code points. And now we need an encoding to put them on a file or transmit them over the network. So again, we could either use ISO or we could use the Windows one. But as you can see, they are a little different, just subtly different so that it's annoying. Fortunately, these days you should all be just using UTF. But originally, we didn't have a good uh, encoding yet. And people said, hey, if one byte is not enough to you know, encode everything, how about we use two bytes? That should be enough for everybody, right? So we basically started interleaving everything with zero bytes, unless we really needed those bytes um, to express some character that didn't fit in the first uh, byte. But the problem now is like, which interleave should be zero? Like, so like, what is the ordering of those bytes? And in fact, that was a huge problem at the time. Uh, there's two options and both are equally valid. So every piece of information had to um, contain the byte order mark at the beginning of the text which was very confusing, and sometimes with text operations you would get stuff that is incorrect or um, missing. So that was not very good. Worst of all, UTF-16 um, was error-prone also because it contained the zero um, byte. And, and absolutely zeros are obviously a terminator for strings in C, so that was um, you know, a source of endless joy for text processing at the time. Fortunately, at this point, we came, uh, came up with this. UTF-8 is the encoding you should be using for everything. It solves all the problems. It has some caveats, but this is because text handling is hard. What it does is it's a variable length encoding, which is compatible with ASCII for everything that is in the first seven bits. And for everything else, it uses two bytes, three bytes, or maybe four bytes for a single character. So as you can see, like all those easy uh, Western characters are simply the same as in ASCII. All the others might be subtly different. But what do I mean that they might need like two bytes or three or four? Like how do we encode this? The rule is actually pretty easy, right? If the um, byte starts with a zero, that means like yes, it's the first seven bits. It's the first. Uh, it's ASCII compatible. If it starts with a one, there's a simple rule. If it's 110, there's going to be one continuation byte. If there's 1110, there's going to be two, and so on. So um, there's actually a pretty trivial algorithm to parse all this. But suddenly, we are getting the problem that we cannot easily maintain, like, you know, um, calculate the length of a string just by saying, how many bytes do I have here? Well, because you don't know what those bytes contain. Fortunately, uh, with Unicode strings, this is solved. But if you encode them, you don't have text anymore. Now you have just some random bytes that maybe encode to uh, a, a piece of text and maybe not. So if we encoded this, what we're getting is just binary data. So you see, they're going to take four bytes for a Western uh, message, and they're going to take more for something that is using either Polish characters or emoji or whatever. Better yet. Some letters don't even fit in the form of uh, you know, four bytes per character. They're, in fact, outside of the so-called um, uh, base multilingual plane. So what do we do with them? Then there's a way of composing in Unicode where you can have like, multiple partial characters combined with one another. So there's still a bigger block for this. And the problem with that was that um, those characters don't really work well in Python 2 if you want to uh, order them or if you want to even represent a single byte. I'm going to show an example just on a few slides later. But now I wanted to show you how a character like this actually is represented in Unicode. So there's similarly to how UTF-8 you know, orders uh, multi-byte characters, we can have multi-byte characters composed into um, surrogate pairs. 
This thing actually takes six bytes to be represented. Note the bomb. There was a UTF-32, because obviously you can you know, go the rabbit hole and say, hey, if I cannot really uh, use two bytes, maybe I can use four bytes, because I really need to be quick about processing data, and then I just like, you know, divide by four, and I know how long my string is. The problem is that almost right there, like, so still there's gonna be characters outside of what you can represent here, and the problem doesn't really ever go away, which is why you should always use UTF-8, that's the uh, most you know, encoding efficient algorithm, and it's backwards compatible with ASCII, and doesn't use the zero byte, which is problematic in C. So the lesson summary here is that UTF-8 is the best algorithm to use here, the best encoding because it's backwards compatible, doesn't use the zero byte, wastes the least memory, and doesn't require the bomb that, as you already know, like, might either be erroneous or just is um, wasteful to uh, process all the time. But the thing that people often say in like sentences when they discuss those problems is like Unicode is an encoding, but as you should probably already know, like Unicode is not an encoding, right? Unicode is this thick book that basically just tells you how many code points are there and what those code points uh, represent. UTF-8 is an encoding, right? And this is the one that you should be using. Code points can be stored in files in many ways by encoding them into bytes. And not all encodings can represent all characters. Whenever Python encounters a character in the input stream that cannot be encoded using the current encoding, it raises a Unicode encode error. This is why you sometimes see those particular um, exceptions when you're trying to use ASCII as an encoding and specify a character that just doesn't fit in the first 128 uh, uh, um, code points, then you're gonna have a mm, bad time. Once you save bytes to a file, they're no longer code points. It's binary data. You can read it back correctly only if you know what encoding was used when the data was written. Otherwise, it's just guesswork. There's no such thing as plain text. So whenever Python encounters a sequence of bytes in the input stream that cannot be decoded to a Unicode string using the current encoding, it raises a Unicode decode error. That typically means there's some stream of data either from a file or from the network, and you're just trying to naively use ASCII to decode them, but you know, lo and behold, either they're simply binary or they are just Latin one or you know, uh, UTF-8. Fortunately, for many things here, Python 3 got things better. As you can see here, Python 2 didn't quite get the concept of one single character should always have the length of one. For characters outside of the base multilingual plane in Python 2, even if you were using the U prefix, the length of your characters will still be wrong. That is even more problematic if you start actually mangling those characters, you know, doing uh, conversion between bytes and um, Unicode characters, in which case things from outside of the base multilingual plane would just refuse to be accepted as a single character, right? Which actually ends up being a very confusing type error. So now, to sum it all up, a single character is not an easy concept. It can be either a code point within the base multilingual plane, which means the first 65,000 characters, or a surrogate pair, that is, all the characters outside of it, which mostly is emojis. It can be a grapheme cluster or a sorting element, which means you can have perfectly valid characters, but they should sort differently than you would expect. Python 2 fails on most of those things, except for the first one. But wait. Graphing clusters, what, do I, what did I just say? Like, is there even like more to this? Yes, there is, of course. Um, Unicode lets you compose characters not only by just specifying, hey, let me go through the thick book and you know, select the right code point for what I mean. What you can also do, you can just say, hey, I mean this Latin character and then I just wanna combine it with, with something and the result is exactly the thing I, I mean. So this code example shows you uh, one particular example of this, where you're just using a Latin capital letter C and combine a cedilla with it. 
you would think, who would ever do that? But in fact, um, if you're using a Mac, your file system does exactly this. It normalizes every uh, Unicode string to the decomposed form, such that it actually tra uh, transfers very well when you want to just throw out everything that isn't Latin and just leave the ASCII uh, component of it. If you have this normalized extended form, that's easy to do. If you have all those uh, Unicode characters like smashed into their very code points, it's much harder. So normalization is yet another thing that you have to understand. Like There can be many possible forms that represent the same text as visible by a person. So all your code should process text using the Unicode string type because of all of those things. And using bytes for text handling is just a bug that traditionally just generally does not work. But what, what do I mean, like Unicode string and using bytes? Like what does that even mean? So the thing is, Python 2 and Python 3 confusingly reuse the name str to actually mean different things. In Python 3, the th situation is simple. Strings, so text, are str. Binary data is bytes. The world is simple. In Python 2, text is actually Unicode. And binary data is called str, but also bytes. And that str is a lie. It's really just a bytes object with many text-like operations on it. So that previous lesson could be really just you know formally called this, but that sounds more confusing. str on Python 3, Unicode on Python 2. Bytes on Python 2 are also known as string. This example is particularly hairy. Python 2 was lying to you by trying to be helpful. If you were combining a piece of binary data with an actual text string, it would try to basically coerce everything to a Unicode string. So for some strings, that would actually work, because that default encoding that would be used in that particular case would just work perfectly fine. But for others, so the same piece of code, might encounter a different stream of data that would end with an exception. And that's the Unicode decode error that I told you about before. So imagine if that B2 happened to only contain ASCII characters. Python 2 would silently work until Aukash came along, and you'd get an exception right there in production, uh, maybe a long time later. So what does Python 3 do that makes people so crazy? It just refuses to do that operation in the first place. It just tells you, hey, you need to fix your code because if just you know some guy from Eastern Europe comes along, you're both going to be unhappy. And I think this is actually pretty good because it will refuse to go forward even in the first example. It could theoretically just use the default encoding and just make things do, but this ensures that you won't end up with errors much later. So another lesson, when reading data from external sources, expect bytes and then decode them with B decode. UTF-8 is given as like an example because obviously you should always use UTF-8 unless you really know what you're doing. When writing data back to a file or the network, encode it with U encode. Avoid using str and bytes without specifying an encoding. That's ugly. That will not work across Python 2 and Python 3 in the same way. Um, you know, if you're converting it without specifying an encoding, you're sort of undefined. You know, you're hitting undefined behavior. This is defined but tricky to explain, so avoid doing that. Be explicit. It's better than implicit, right? So all of this, if you do it carefully, you handled most of the problems. But Python 3 cannot save you from text handling that is essentially a hard problem. For example, collation, which just is a fancy name for sorting, is not easy to do if you don't know the current user's locale. And even if it is, it is a pretty computationally heavy operation. So what you need to do to actually have this work is um, install some third-party application like PyICU and have that um, library handle operations like this in its computationally heavy way. That incidentally also causes me to always appear at the very end of any list, which is annoying. All right, if you want to convert a character to uppercase and lowercase, you might be surprised that they don't always run trip. This is because sometimes there's multiple choices to how to you know, convert one to the other. 
And um, the default algorithms had to, you know, sort of choose one or the other because they don't understand context. They don't know the entire word that you're uh, converting. They, they're not operating on the levels of words. So again, you would have to use PyICU or a similar library to make sure that upper casing and lower casing works in Turkey as well. Python 2 had an additional problem that mostly is, uh, you know, went away, but if you're using a very old Linux version or maybe some other, um, you know, operating system, you're going to still see this. If you had a narrow build of Python, all the characters outside of the base multilingual plane would just not exist and you could not process them at all. There's more. Regular expressions behave differently if you're doing Unicode handling and if you're doing binary handling. Um, most of this is solved in Python 3, but you can still not match things that are in this wrong um, normalized form and if you're talking graphene clusters and whatever. Text segmenting, right to left text, I just cannot believe how bad the life of people uh, living like in places on Earth that require RTL has to be at this point. But the thing that I really wanted for you to understand is that this is not just an internationalized text problem, right? Uh, there's many examples where characters outside of seven bits get introduced to the data stream. That includes literary characters like dashes, quotation marks, section signs, pilcrow signs, etc. If you have math signs in your uh, text, it's all also gonna be outside of uh, ASCII. And most importantly, emojis. So summing it all up, programs which assume you can open a plain text file without specifying an encoding are broken. Code points in which you're operating text are abstract theoretical concepts. They specify which character you mean, but you cannot just put it on disk. You can store code points in files by encoding them into bytes. Not all encodings represent all characters. Once you save bytes to a file, they're no longer code points, they're just binary data. You can read it back correctly only if you know what encoding was used when the data was written, otherwise it's guesswork. There's no such thing as plain text. A single character in your text can be a base multilingual plain code point, a surrogate pair, a grapheme cluster, or a sorting element. All your code should process text using the Unicode string type for the reason. Using bytes for text handling is a bug. Decode things using dot decode, encode using dot de uh, encode, and avoid using str and bytes without specifying encodings. And finally, decode early, encode late. So if you're now thinking, what the hell was that all about? Like, I have a graph for you. If you're inside your application A, or maybe application B, like depending on if you'd rather be on the left or the right, you are in the world of Unicode strings. You can pretty much, um, you know, transform text any way you like. However, if you want to put it on disk or transfer it over the network, you have to encode it to bytes. So the green things here are the Unicode strings. The red arrows represent binary data. This was the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lukas Langa. The slides are available here. Thanks. All right. So if there's any question, please come to the microphone. We have a few minutes. All right. Hi. Can you give, <coughs> sorry, can you give an example of a character that can't be encoded in UTF-32? Or that can't be encoded in four bytes in UTF-32? Yes, uh, these are the old italic characters. Uh, these are not encoded in the, like, the, the same things that are using uh, surrogate pairs are not, as uh, you know, encodable in UTF-32 because they are actually not specifying rules that um, use all the eight bytes, um, you know, uniformly. So we're basically like wasting a lot of space for the rules that they chose. Uh, but most of those that you cannot represent are the newest characters and the newest Unicode standard. So most of those are like the added, you know, like poop emoji with a hat, right? Or like stuff <laughs> like this.
the uh, the length dot length whatever can you distinguish between the length of the data versus the length of the text yes if you have a unicode string what you are uh, dealing with is the length of text uh, and there's no length of data at this point we are dealing with abstract you know information if you encode it to any encoding then that data that you got you can uh, again length it and uh, get the you know, transfer binary length of it. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>